Learn from tutors and ex-examiners who are masters of IELTS preparation. Your host, Ben Worthington. Hello there. This episode, we're going to look at the difference between band 7 and band 9 essay. By listening to this podcast, you'll hopefully get it clearer in your mind the differences between the band 7 essays and the band 9 essays. First of all, let's have a look at the expectations of the examiner. So the criteria is what they're using to kind of guide their expectations. And a band 9 essay will answer the question in full with a very well-developed response. So this means that it's perfectly cohesive, it's paragraphed, and it uses a range of language expressions and accurate structure. So when we're saying language expressions, we're saying that it uses different, how would you say, different like idiomatic expressions, different uh, collocation like expressions, different ways of expressing the same kind of ideas or different ideas as well and accurate structure. So we're using the correct grammatical structure in a perfect way or near perfect way. Now a band 7 essay will answer the question but there's opportunity to develop to develop uh, the answer a little bit more fully and the essay will also attempt cohesive structure and a logical flow but there might be some connectors missing there so a band 7 essay will also have sufficient scope of language so that's probably more um, basic vocabulary, not basic, not the same basic vocabulary that we use in spoken English. It'll be higher than that, but it will be um, it'll be sophisticated, but not at the level of a seven of a nine. Obviously, there might be some redundancy with a band seven essay, and redundancy is. It's not a difficult concept, but it does need practice. And in the sentence guide, it's like an advanced chapter we include. And um, it's quite easy to learn, but you do need some practice. I won't go into the details here, um, but it is a useful skill to learn. And also, once you've learned the skill, you need to put it into practice and get some feedback as well otherwise the improvement is more difficult so that's why it's uh, like a bonus advanced chapter and if you are doing the sentence guide then I'd strongly recommend doing it and you'll probably get asked by the tutor to do ten, write out 10 sentences uh, in a non-redundant form just to, just so that we're both absolutely certain that you've mastered that skill because you do need to get feedback on it to uh, use it correctly. Now also going back to band 7 essay there might be a few errors regarding your word choice or a few minor grammatical mistakes. Now I think the best way to teach this or the best way to communicate it is to give you some examples. So the first one I'll give you the question if you're serious about improving then you might as well write down the question and attempt to answer it and just um, practice your idea generation skills. So here's the question. Should wealthy people be obliged to share their financial success with poor people by supporting health services and education? Or is this the responsibility of the poor to improve their own standard of living? Let's see. Now, if you've been listening to the other podcasts, you'll know that the first stage is to understand the question, then we're going to look at some ideas, and then we're going to put the ideas into a structure. 
all of that is covered, like I said before, in the sentence guide. What we're going to do now is analyze the answer, and I want you to tell me, looking at the answer, or hearing the answer, if you think this would be a band 7 or a band 9. Let's start. I believe that wealthy people should be obliged to share their wealth with poorer, with poorer people, but they shouldn't have to support health services and education only, but other areas if they prefer. Okay, now let, I'll just analyze this sentence. Now you can immediately tell that there is, that that's a band seven. And I mean, first of all, we kind of jump in there with the introduction. There should be at least a topic sentence just introducing the whole topic of wealth distribution and these kind of these concepts, just in, introducing the topic, but it goes straight in there with two feet with their opinion. So that's a red flag. Then the second sentence it says, but they shouldn't have to support health services and education only, but other areas if they prefer. Now there's two problems maybe three even, three problems here. The first one is the, the um, we've started the sentence with but, which isn't the most recommendable thing to do. There's more eloquent structures available. And also, we've put but again in the same sentence. So, um, Immediately, we can see that there is uh, some redundancy there. By using the word but, the sentence could have been restructured in a way that we don't have to repeat the, the conjugation but. Also, just going back to the introduction, it only addresses one part of the question. So that goes back to what we said before about addressing all aspects of the question. The introduction, in this case, has just skipped over half of the question. So that's another red flag. So we've got like three or four red flags already. Another red flag is that we've got a contraction. And we shouldn't be reusing these contractions. We should be writing it out full because contractions are more suited for informal writing and spoken English. So those are um, the red flags for that introduction. It's just a small introduction as well. Also, um, we've got, if we want to go into further detail, it repeats the word people twice. Yeah, I believe that wealthy people should be obliged to share their wealth with poorer people. So we've got wealthy, wealth, people, people. And, yeah, why not just write down three versions or three, or think of three different words that we could use instead of people. So when we're reviewing our essay, we can try and identify um, words that are repeated and try and think of synonyms. So what other synonyms could we have for people in this context? Well, we could say with, um, with poorer parts of the society with poorer parts of the population, or with the less economically advantaged, or with the economically disadvantaged citizens. So, especially with the word people, and in a, in a context of society, there are insane amounts of opportunities to improve it. Let's go on to the second paragraph. First of all, we cannot avoid people which are poor. As an example, we see homeless in the train station, at the bus stops, and asking us for money. Rich people have extra money and therefore they should give some help to people with no housing and money. So just by hearing this, we can, um, we can, we can hear there's a lot of repetition here. And like we said before, if we're reviewing our work, let's go through it and let's take the words that we're repeating and find synonyms and improve our vocabulary, our lexical resource score. What could we say instead of money? We could have say um, our income, 
or uh, economic means. Let's see, or rich people have surplus income, or rich people have um, excess uh, salaries. I mean, you probably have to reorganize the sentence or maybe just word other parts of it differently, but it's quite easy, I think, especially if you're doing exercises to build your vocabulary on a daily basis. So, the first sentence, first of all, we cannot avoid people which are poor. How would you say that correctly? We would say, who are poor? And also, if we wanted to take it to a really le a better level, we could, we could say we cannot avoid poor people. And we're saying the same with less, and this is a succinct style that we want to adopt in our writing. Also, it says, as an example. We don't really need to say as an example. We can say, for example, we see homelessness I think would have been better or even we could we like I said in a, a recent podcast we could just put a list onto this a list we could say um, it is common and we change the personal pronoun into um, uh, into the passive structure with it as the subject so say it is common to see uh, homelessness um, tramps Tramps, maybe not. <laughs> Might be a bit direct. Um, it is common. It is common to see uh, disadvantaged people, especially the homeless, in places like train stations, bus stops, and community parks, asking for money. Okay. And what I did there was just change, take out the personal pronouns, and made it a more general um, sentence. And, um, yeah, so that's how we would modify that sentence. And it's still not perfect, but it's a big improvement. But anyway, we shouldn't be looking at the improvements. We're looking at the errors. Sorry. So rich people have extra money. We can change the word money. We can say resources, income, and therefore they should give some help to people with no housing and money. So like we said before, we change that to less disadvantaged. And also you can see that this sentence is very opinionated. It says they should give some help to people. It's not really the best and most academically, um, it's not really the best and it's not in an academic style to write like that. What we should say is um, uh, various experts believe that income should be distributed to help those with no housing or economic means. Can you see? And there we've kind of, instead of voicing our opinion directly, we've just kind of said various experts believe. And this is a good technique instead of using personal pronouns or writing strong opinionated sentences. Now, Next, the next paragraph, secondly, many people are not finding jobs or, although they are working, they are not having enough money to pay for his houses or flats, especially in city living, which has a high cost of living now. Hmm. So that sentence is um, very clumsy. There's lots of errors there. You can just hear them. Um, also, we've used a negative construction. We said, are not finding jobs. There's nothing wrong with a negative construction, but the, the better the writer is, they would probably find a negative verb to use there. Okay, like they often lack jobs or they often lack housing. And like I said before, we're saying the same with less words in a more uh, concise and succinct manner and writing in a succinct style is the objective here this is very if you're writing in a succinct style which means using the least amount of words possible then that's good academic writing not the flowery type okay you do need to put some flowery expressions in but very very sparingly also going on with the analysis, continuing with the analysis, we have another negative construction. We say they are not having enough money, which also sounds 
um, very clumsy. It's the wrong tense and it's another negative construction. So we could also say they often lack financial resources to pay for their houses, flats or residences. And we just squeeze in a little bit more vocabulary, but we also changed it to the plural to avoid putting agenda on the person, okay? And there are a few more errors, but I'm gonna move on to the band nine, and we're going to look at how this, how this paragraph or this essay was constructed. So if you, you probably guessed it by now, but that first paragraph, that first essay was obviously a band seven, probably a little bit lower than a band seven, because there's quite a lot more errors there. And let's have a look at how a band nine would be written. You would be surprised at the difference. Let's have a look. First of all, the, top, the, the, the introduction. Income and equality is an issue that has plagued civilization since the beginning of time. Plagued civilization, small collocation there. Whereas some societies strongly disagree with every man for himself, that was in inverted commas, others believe in helping their neighbor. So we've got quite a sophisticated construction with whereas, we're kind of like balancing the viewpoints and we've used an idiomatic expression, every man for himself. And it's not just a case of sticking in these idiomatic expressions, it's a case of using them in an eloquent and accurate fashion. And we've also um, played on another expression of helping the neighbor, which is a common way to express of helping other people out when you say um, helping, helping your neighbor. The next sentence, the following essay will cover European approaches using real world examples to support arguments. So that's, um, it's an okay sentence. We're not going to pick up massive points, but it's just to uh, improve coherence of the rest of the essay. So it is, it is useful, actually, because it's going to, like I said, just help the examiner or the reader follow where we're going. Body paragraph one starts with a topic sentence. Wealth distribution for social ends such as healthcare and education, is seen as a basic societal right in Denmark. So, not only have we used the topic-specific uh, collocation, wealth distribution, but we've said for social ends. And that's a sophisticated, less common grammatical structure, or like expression for social ends. Yeah, we can say for humanitarian ends, for health ends just means with the objective of society in mind, in this case. And then we've also said a basic societal right. So instead of just saying the common way, a basic right, we said a ba basic societal right. So it's a specific right that's unique to society. Next sentence. There are tremendous benefits for equaling the playing field. Equaling the playing field course we're not talking about a game of football but it's another expression which means to basically yeah to level things to make sure that it's um each child has a more fairer right or a more fairer opportunity um than without the government help or intervention so the expression there is equaling the playing field, or we can also say leveling the playing field. Then we go into the next sentence, which is an example, a solid real world example. For example, a recent study by the University of Copenhagen showed that when the rich were forced into sharing their income amongst the economically challenged, over 70% of the wealthy reported feeling a higher sense of well-being afterwards. So, quite a long sentence, I must admit, but it's not a disaster to include a long sentence. Um, it's grammatically coherent. It's a risky strategy um, because the longer the sentence, the greater the chance of a grammatical mistake. However, 
uh, the writer here knew and was 100% confident that it's grammatically perfect. So I kind of justified in being able to pull it off. If you're not that confident, then you probably want to avoid long sentences like that. Okay? So we can also see, uh, see the structure, a higher sense of well-being. Okay? This isn't band 7 um, structure. These aren't band 7 structures. Um, then the next sentence. And also, not... Um, from a task response point of view, you can see that the first paragraph is totally dealing with the first part of the question. Should wealthy people be obliged to share their financial sex with success with the poor people by supporting health services and education? So here we've kind of focused on just sharing the income. Perhaps it could have been improved to, to mention um, share their income for health purposes or for, to support a health program but that's like your after sight there that's <laughs> been able to look back at it now but that would be one possible improvement and the final sentence therefore comma although it is undoubtedly contentious so we'll put in a conjunction in there and we're improving our structure a grammatical range and structure although it is undoubtedly contentious there are tremendous benefits for rich and poor alike to participate in wealth sharing endeavors. So can you see that less common structure? It's a little bit of flair, a little bit of style. There are tremendous benefits for rich and poor alike. So it's basically saying there are, both, there are tremendous benefits for both rich and poor to participate in wealth sharing endeavors. Okay, but it's just slightly less common. We're increasing our grammatical range and structure score and we're using it accurately. So we're going to pick up some very good points for that. Also, we can see um, for rich and poor alike to participate in wealth sharing endeavors. So perhaps that's not a totally accurate sentence because we're saying for rich and poor to participate in wealth sharing endeavors. Perhaps the poor aren't directly participating in wealth sharing because they're not wealth sharing, they're the recipient, recipients. However, um, I strongly believe that the, the, that sentence would still pick up points because we're not nitpicking, we're looking for a strong use of confident grammar structures, which in wealth sharing endeavors is a very good example of that. Next body paragraph. Secondly, evidence from history shows that laying the responsibility with the poor to improve their lot is clearly an erroneous policy. So first of all, we can see that that sentence directly corresponds with the second part of the question, which goes, or is this the responsibility of the poor to improve their own standard of living? Now, not only did we directly answer that question very clearly and grammatically perfect, but we've used some of the structures. We said laying the responsibility with. That just means putting the responsibility on somebody. So laying the responsibility with the poor. And then we've used an idiomatic expression, which was to improve the lot. And that's a collocation. Um, so it's not a collocation, it's an idiomatic expression. It's used correctly. It's not forced. It's entirely appropriate for this essay, for this sentence. And then instead of saying, uh, sorry, to improve the lot means just to improve your situation, and usually in an economical sense. So it's entirely appropriate, like I said before. And then we say afterwards, is clearly an erroneous policy. So we don't say it's clearly wrong or clearly there are disadvantages. We say it's an erroneous policy because we want to show the examiner we've got extensive vocabulary and we can use fancy words like erroneous, which just basically means wrong. So next sentence. In most humanitarian governmental bodies, ching, 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 vocab score, lexical resource, humanitarian governmental bodies, 
Scientific reports have proved countless times, and I'm getting stronger here, I'm making my example clear, crystal clear, countless times, that the initiative must start with external existence. For instance, pilot studies showed that when poverty-stricken collocation individuals were motivated by more than just themselves, i.e. external mentors, they had a success rate three times higher than self-motivated candidates. So we're using lots of different vocabulary. Instead of constantly using the poor, we said candidates. We talked about um, external motivation. We said poverty stricken. All these words are going to pick up points. And we clearly demonstrated that the poor cannot help themselves in this case and that they needed a mentor. So going back to the question, is it the responsibility of the poor to improve their own standard of living? I'm arguing in this paragraph that it's not that they, that they get better help uh, with a mentor. So this is the, um, it's the most effective way of helping them. That's what I'm saying. So we shouldn't put the emphasis on themselves, helping themselves, we should be helping the poor to get out of that situation. Okay, this is the general direction of the body paragraph two. So then I finish, I conclude in a similar fashion to the other paragraph. I say thus, experts generally agree that the most effective humanitarian assistance, I think I already, yeah, I oh know I put humanitarian governmental bodies, so it's kind of similar. The most effective humanitarian assistance involves helping one to help themselves. Another idiomatic expression used correctly. Help one, you've got to help someone to help themselves. Okay? Which underscores the common expression, no man is an island. So, if, you are, uh, if you're familiar with that expression, you know that it means that you can't do things on yourself, that it's better to do them with assistance, with help, with a team, and that the human race uh, works better when working together rather than every man for himself. Okay, And it's just um, a stylistic way of basically saying um, it's not a case of every man for himself, it's a case of helping each other out. So, yeah. So I'll just repeat that sentence. Thus experts generally, generally agree that the most effective humanitarian assistance involves helping one to help themselves, which underscores the common expression, no man is an island. So very strong scoring paragraph is grammatically perfect. We've got idiomatic expressions. We've got topic specific vocabulary. We've got a clear response to the task. So we're going to score full points for task response because we've attacked the question and we haven't, maybe we've gone slightly, very slightly off topic, um, talking about that with a motivator, it's more effective, but I'm still arguing the same point that the poor can't help themselves, that they need help. Okay, and this goes, and then it's clearly communicated um, with a mixture of more sophisticated structures, more sophisticated vocabulary, and idiomatic expressions. Then we're going to finish with a very clear, brief conclusion, because we're already at about 275 words, which is the absolute limit. And we're going to say, to conclude, it is clear that when the rich share their wealth, albeit under duress, another scoring um, opportunity there, used correctly, albeit, which is sort of like but, and under duress, which means with force, it's just an eloquent, stylistic way of saying it, albeit under duress, they stand to benefit. Furthermore, when the poor... So in that sentence, we answered part one of the question and then part two um, of the question, should the poor help themselves? We're going to check quickly, briefly answer it. Furthermore, when the poor gain direct support, gain direct support, 
the help given has a multiplier effect. So another collocation there because we said three times higher before in the body paragraph and then we finish we're saying therefore both actions should be strongly encouraged. Perhaps it's a slightly rushed conclusion. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we have to remember the bulk of the points will be picked up in body paragraph one and two and adding that stylistic albeit under, under duress is just an extra opportunity to pick up points. So hopefully you can see there that if you want to do if you want to write at a band nine level not only do you write with idiomatic expressions collocations and a, and an extremely high level grammatical accuracy um, but you also do it within the time limit and within the word limit of course so there we go i hope i haven't scared you and i think if you want to start using your idiomatic expressions Go with the simpler ones, the ones that you can almost squeeze into any essay. And these would be ones like um, all four corners of the world, because you can use that because you're going to be writing about something in this world. And you're also going to be, it's just an opportunity to use it. And also what I wanted to say was, find one that you're comfortable with, a generic one like the one I just mentioned, and use that in lots of different essays and get completely comfortable with it rather than trying to list uh, learn a massive list and then forcing them in inappropriate situations which would cost you points okay so good luck and if you want to start writing and improve your writing have a look at the sentenceguide.com or if you're not at that level yet and you don't feel like investing in a course then you can still sign up to ieltspodcast.com newsletter and get a massive PDF full of materials that will help you. And in part of that IELTS materials, there's a big uh, section which is called IELTS vocabulary with lots of collocations and TED videos. So you can watch the videos, see the collocations, see how they're used, write out sentences using them. And this is a very effective technique for boosting your vocabulary. Okay, my name is Ben Worthington. You've been listening to IELTS Podcast. Um, have a good day and good luck in your exam. IELTSPodcast.com